thank you again for coming. We, this is a special day, it's Juneteenth. So we all know about that. It's Juneteenth National Holiday. And we're also celebrating and helping Dale Honus, Commissioner Dale Honus, and his journey. He's a candidate for Congress. So please give a warm welcome to him. We want to help him on his journey. So this is just the beginning. So anything we can do to support, make phone calls, whatever we can do to help him get there, it benefits us all, but it benefits everyone. So I want to thank you all again for coming out. And uh, myself and my husband you. Gus, Gigi, as you know him, want to thank you for coming out. And I want to introduce his wife, who, Kim, on this, who will say a few words, and we'll head it over to the commission. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? I'm a little... Okay, like this? Okay, now you can hear me. Oh, awesome. Thank you everyone for coming. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate our neighbors um, doing this for us and hosting this. And our neighbors from all over this area that need to support us. We really appreciate everybody's support. Um, I obviously know Commissioner Holmes on a different level, um, but I met him about 17 years ago, and um, I thought he was an amazing, fascinating person when I spoke with him and was intrigued by all of the things that he was involved in. Um, but the one thing I learned very quickly coming here is that he's fearless. And he will fight for things when other people will not. He will stand up for the black community in ways that people have no clue. And I know I'm probably embarrassing you a little bit. <laughs> but um, I can say these things because I know his heart. And I know the drive that he has. And I know how much he's outside doing what he's doing um, every day. And so if you're going to elect someone for Congress that's going to work for you, trust me. It's this man. He's going to work hard every day uh, from sunup to sundown and beyond sometimes. <laughs> um, I didn't understand that at first when I first came. I'm like, how in the world can you be out till 2 o'clock in the morning? Anyway, he's working, trust me. And he's standing up for the rights of all people and doing what is best for the entire community, not just for some people. And that's what we have to watch out for in this race is that there are people out there that want to be involved but they're only working for a few. They're not working for everyone. And he will work for everyone. So with that, I will let my husband speak. Thank you for coming, everyone. One swat to me. You want to start as a total? Well, go on. I know there's at least two Jamaicans in here. Thank you. So when you were all cheering me on that, hey, you won, you won, you won, I said, no, we won. No, it's time for us to get to work. Started the Chamber of Commerce within a few months. In March was election. By August, I had the Chamber of Commerce run for the city. By October, we did our first business expo in the history of the city of Lauderdale. And Antia kind of played the role of executive director of the chamber when we just got started. Got all of Lauderdale business online within that year. Got a city to put $100,000 funding into the chamber. A few months later, we got Lord Hill Education A Plus plan uh, on the way with some much brighter people than me. Uh, we built a plan, a Lord Hill Education A Plus plan, funded with $100,000 from the city also, because I thought that's something we needed to do to improve the schools. They were failing schools, mostly. We were giving teachers reimbursement. $35,000 funds went the teachers who had to buy supplies for the children out of their pockets. Because that's something that hurts young people when they don't have the supplies to do what they need to do in the classroom. So that went on for quite a number of years. And, and then the county commission seat was about to become vacant because I was told that everyone in the political realm realized that the gentleman that was there was having some issues and would be taken out of office. Lost that race, five-way race, lost by quite a bit. I came in third out of five. But that set up for the next election in 20, 
10 because that gentleman was taken out in 2009. I ran that race and they thought, oh no, wholeness can't beat Carlton Moore. And any, anybody been around Brock County for a long time? They would have heard the name Carlton Moore. He was a venerable politician. Right? Yes, he was. Probably second in terms of statute to only Congressman Alcee Hastings at the time. And I won because I outworked my friend Carlton. He was a friend. He made a friend to the spot pass. And we were on the streets together in with NAACP. I was with Operation Push, People United to Serve Humanity, Rainbow Coalition, Jesse Jackson's group. Got to the county. And, 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 I, and I have always maintained what's very important for a community, for a country, for, uh, for a state, is that we help the entrepreneur spirit that people have to build their own businesses. Did you clap? That drives innovation. And if you look at a country, the largest percentage of growth in the economy and in employment, it's not the largest corporation. It's just all these small corporations, hiring two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten people. And they actually grow to be the large corporation because they're usually more flexible, more innovative, creative. So I wanted to ensure that we're helping our small businesses. I got there, 10 and a quarter percent of the county's procurement went to small women and minority-owned businesses. Today, David, we're at 44% because we break down contracts. We didn't have all these huge contracts. We set preferences up for the local businesses, for the small businesses. We put goals in place on the larger contracts for the a major contractors to uh, bring smaller contracts. We put a mentorship program in place. We put technical support program in place. And we're getting to where we put finances in place to help these businesses also. Because it's critical for us to continue to grow or prosperity. All at the same time looking at the disparities that exist in our community. When you look at Broad County, you'll find a central core along 95 that has been in poverty for the 44 years that I've lived here. Nothing much has changed. There's 60 zip codes that have a tremendous amount of unemployment, poverty, and all other kind of problems. We never really made the investments into these communities. Now we're doing that because I've pushed that effort program called Prosperity Up. Uh, Broad College has Prosperity uh, Broad Up. And then the Alliance has Prosperity Broad. That's because I've been relentless in pushing the larger corporate entities and our bigger business and our governmental entities to understand that part of what we must do is ensure that those who've been left behind gets into the realm of prosperity because it benefits all of us. I'm not going to talk for too long because I know it's been a long evening. Another thing in the area of business that I engage with, and that is Florida's International Trade and Cultural Expo. Itsy. Started in 2015 when the county wouldn't give me any money. My colleagues delayed me for a bit. Then I finally says, you know what? Don't worry about the money. I'll go raise it. Just give me the okay that I can use my office, my staff, to do this on behalf of Broward County. Finally, they gave me some money in the next budget year. But today, that event is the largest international trade event in the whole of the Southeast United States of America. We had a presidential award because of that. That started with Kennedy in 1960. Broward County won that award in 2019. I've led several trade missions to different parts of the world. To Nigeria, Ghana, India, Israel, Trinidad, Costa Rica, Colombia, and elsewhere. Because I think it's fundamental for us as a country to sell more of our goods and our services to the rest of the world. They're not going to do it from Washington. It has to be done right here in our community. So given our businesses the technical support, 
the resources necessary to do so is critical. And if any of you pay any attention to what's going on around the world, China is leading in taking these markets from us, especially emerging markets in Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean, and Asia. They have a strategy, a 100-year plan. They have a thing called the Belt and Road Initiative. And if you ever want to get an insight into what's going on there, you should read the book, The New Silk Road. They want to tie the world around them. So you might see and hear other things that's going on, but they're really serious about dominating the world from an economic standpoint. And that's where the real power is. They don't have what we have. They don't have you. No other country in the world has the diverse population that we do. In Broward County, we speak about 170 something language representing 200 countries plus. China have it? No. Yet they're all selling us. We need to ensure that Washington give our business the technical support, ensure that financing is there to fund the projects. There's a group, there's an entity called OPEC that, that I work with. There's also uh, the U.S. Commerce Department that does that. Each of our embassy, by the way, almost all of them have a commercial attaché that can help your business if you should do, want to do business anywhere. That sets an appointment up, set up to six appointments for you over two days. Only cost, cost less than $2,000. Most of our businesses don't know that. That there's someone from the embassy in Nigeria, in Ghana, in Colombia, in India, can call for targeted business that you want to reach out to and set those appointments and accompany you there. That's a powerful tool that we're not utilizing to the extent that we should. When we grow our economy, we prosper more. And if we help Haiti build their infrastructure, if we help Nigeria, Ghana build their infrastructure, it takes nothing from us, we gain. Because I can tell you this, that many of these countries has a trade imbalance with us. We have a surplus to them. Where our trade, where our tra trade uh, deficit is, is China, Europe, and elsewhere. It's not the emerging markets. Because they need our goods and our services more than anywhere else. And when they make money, guess where they send it? Right back here. Their kids come to school, they go, uh, go on vacation, here. They come here and buy our stuff. This custom district uh, of South Florida, which is called the Miami Custom Districts, has either the second, first, second, or third highest trade surplus of any custom districts in the United States. Why? Because we're selling right here to Latin America and the Caribbean. In fact, if we just took uh, the country of Brazil, that our trade somewhere goes from 12 to $19 billion over the past few years, we have a trade surplus in one year on a $17 billion trade. We only bought $4 billion from them. The rest we sold to them. We need to be doing more of that to these developing countries. So that's a big piece of what, if you send me to the Congress of the United States that I'll be working on, helping our small business locally, helping our business to export more of our goods and our services to the rest of the world. Israel has done a tremendous job with that. If you ever want to take us case study as to what countries do to create really cool, innovative things, look at that. You hear about the fighting with Hamas, uh, which is a tragedy, but I visited Israel. I went from one end to the other. And I can tell you what they're doing with science, technology, advanced manufacturing, even agricultural, using, reusing wastewater to grow plants because they have to desalinate most of their water because they don't have that great amount of, of rainfall. But they are in the We can do the same with even more. So we come back home. We talk about these communities. There's a legislation that passed about two and a half years ago called Opportunity Zones. Anybody ever heard of an Opportunity Zone? You have? Okay, you have? These opportunity zones are created for wealthy folks when they have capital gains to wipe out the taxes on the capital gains. Also, you, you didn't raise your hand because you don't have that bigger money coming from capital gains that you need to shelter. So if you invest in these 
opportunity zones which are primarily urban and, uh, and rural areas, the capital gain that you have would be wiped out uh, if you let that investment stay for about seven years. Supposed to develop these communities. Sounds good. But in practice, does it really work? Not to a great extent. Because there's some elements missing. Nothing in the legislation calls for, and these are youth, the same areas I talked about in Brock County, those six, six zip codes. Most of those opportunity zones are in those zip codes. There's no requirement in the legislation that says people from that community must be hired on any of the jobs that speak for any of the jobs that speak created. Nothing. Not, not a goal, not a requirement. So what you find will happen, as been done with CRAs and other programs that the government has done where we allow for wealthy people to make some more money or to shelter. You will see a creep into these communities where on the fringes you see development and higher income folks move in. And the folks that's in the area can't afford it anymore. They have to move somewhere else. And you take the Sistrunk area and move to Lauder Hill and Lauder their Lakes. So the poverty doesn't change. You just shift it somewhere else. So one, send me to Congress. And we're going to put legislation in that calls for jobs from these opportunities known to be given to the folks that live in those communities. Two, that businesses that are located in these opportunity zones be given the resources and the support to get some of those contracts. And three, that those low income communities where they can pool their funds to an investment fund, especially set up for this kind of stuff, where if they have a thousand dollars and you got a hundred people that can find a thousand, it's a hundred thousand dollars, you can put in the investment and they then become part of the wealth that's created. They will get a return on their money. And that will lift that community up. Otherwise, we're gonna have what's called gentrification on steroids. And it's already happening. So we need to change, we need to put that in place. We also can use these opportunity zones to put more resources into these low-income rural and urban communities to put additional educational funding in place additional support for businesses in those communities, additional funds for health care. Because if you look at these zones, you will also have real bad health outcomes, which costs all of us. So that's something that I think is really big that we should do to enhance uh, the communities. Now, we might want to hide away from the fact that as a nation, we have some issues with race. Most people don't want to talk about it. We pretended for far too long that there's not a problem. And we see time and time again showing up. COVID-19 exposed it in a huge way. So we need to look to see how we empower every American, no matter your race, ethnicity, to be as productive as they can, to create prosperity for themselves and their family, and in the end, create a greater prosperity for the entire country. Last year, I passed an ordinance that created what we call the Racial Equity Task Force. And we look at our lives as a community, see where there are serious inequities that exist, formulate policies, implement those policies to change the dynamics of it. This group will comprise of 38 different people from a wide range of society. We'll have Brown College, we'll have Brown Health, we'll have the Greater Fort Oil Chamber of Commerce, we'll have the Greater Fort Oil Alliance, we'll have the Brown Workshop. And you guys need to research who the workshop is. Those are the folks who tell everybody what to do in Brown County pretty much. At least they try to. That's like the top 100 businesses in Brown. They have a seat at the table and they wanted a seat at the table. Once I explain what this is about and what it will do. So let me go back and tell you one of the reasons that we need to do this. City Financial did a study that was reported out September 2020. After all the stuff we see with George Floyd and COVID, 
And what they found from that study is that this country lost $16 trillion in gross domestic product. It means our economy didn't grow by $16 trillion because of the inequities that exist within our society. $16 trillion. That means everybody suffered from it. What they said, however, is that if we are able to fix these in inequities, we could grow our economy by $5 trillion in the next five years. That means every American will prosper. Because you can't create that model well, and everybody doesn't get benefit from it. The criminal justice system needs to be reformed. We lock up too much people for too little stuff. This year's budget for the county would be $5.8 billion. Guess what our single largest line item is? Or jails. $300 million dollars of your tax money 300 million of your property property tax money 300 million you pay to put people in jail and who do we have in jail poor people sick people young people who don't know what, what life's about yet i'll give you a couple of categories in our jail today 47% of the people that are locked up in Brock County Jail, 47% are on some, psycho, some sort of psychotropic drugs. 47%? That's a lot of money that we have to spend on medical care for these folks and to house them at $161 a night. It could cost more than to go to an absolutely decent hotel, right? For a night in jail. Does that make sense? Yeah? Doesn't make any sense, right? No. Here's something else. What we found is that 70 plus percent of the youths that we arrest or get in trouble have emotional or psychological problems. Is locking up the best thing to do? It's not. We need to find an alternative to that. And there's, a, there's, there's such alternatives that are formulated now. One is civil citation. And I've championed that. I'll give you the statistics on the outcomes of civil citation. But first of all, it's almost, it saved us almost $30 million over the past four years. Cost we spent for it, plus what we could have spent had we locked these kids up. 30 plus, 30 plus million dollars for, ju for juvenile civil citation. That's just the one category. And what, 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 what are these kids doing? Some of them shoplift for 50, 100 bucks. Some of them have open containers of alcohol. Some are loitering. Some have a little scuffle with their friends. Nothing serious. And I believe in assault. This program allows these children to get a ticket, so to speak, a citation. They go through this program that brings resources to their household, let them pay a price by fulfilling some program requirements. And my good friend, uh, my neighbor is from CSE, right? No? Okay. Children's Service Council helped to fund this. And what it does is take them through step-by-step -step approach to how they can better behave. And that's what we need more than anything else. 90% huh? success rate. That means 90 plus percent complete the program successfully. And only 3% of them get back in the system within a year. That's awesome. That's a positive thing. And yet, Broward County ranks third to last an implementation of this program because many of our police department don't want to use it. So whatever city you live, ask your police chief, ask your city elected officials, are you utilizing the civil citation program? I also passed the adult civil citation ordinance. We started first with cannabis. If you have 20 grams or less, we don't need to arrest you. You get a citation. If you're habitual and it causes problems four times, 
You gotta take some steps, get some treatment, get some help. But there are a lot of people who smoke a little weed and never do that wrong. 20 grams or less. Now we're using it for medicine. Totally different. It's sim the adult civil citation program is similar to the juvenile civil citation program. We can do better than we have done in our community, in our state, and in our country. And we'd be better off for it if we fix these issues. And there's so much more that we need to do. We need to ensure that we have health care for everyone. If you don't have good health, how well, can you be productive? And we pay more for health care now than we should. Because if you don't have health insurance, you don't go to the doctor. You know when you're sick. So when it becomes chronic, what do you do? Emergency room. Far more expensive. And it robs us, robs us of people being productive. Because if you're sick, you can't work, you can't produce. So that's something that we must expand the Obamacare. By the way, Obama's first full-time 24-hour place to run his campaign from was my real estate office on Sunrise Boulevard. And the Obamacare affordable health care program, the support for it for five of the 67 counties in the state of Florida was coordinated through that office. Robin Donaldson was there for well over a year after the election, almost two years, to get that program sold to the public. In fact, uh, I was so gracious that they invited me to the White House for the first Christmas dinner that he held for the public. And some folks said, no, he's elected. He's not in the category of volunteers. Some folks said, nobody volunteered more than him. What do you mean he's elected? Doesn't matter that he is. We've got the affordable care done. It has to be expanded. Must grow. Must become more universal for all of us. Our educational system needs more infusion of dollars at every level, especially at the child care level. They care, some folks call it. My sister, who's a big time educator in New York, says no. It's early learning. We have to invest more in that. Because here's the sad thing that we do today in our country. We make an assessment as to how many jail cells to build in the future, or the performance level of kids at third grade. And that's some crazy stuff. It's madness. Instead of deciding how we're gonna put more funding to prevent the kids from failing, we're trying to determine how many jail cells we're gonna build for them in the future. We've got to do that. And it will allow for working families to be more productive. Because one of the largest expense for the young families especially, child care. And if you can't get your child into child care, craziness happening in the household. You can't work and be productive. And it's better to have quality, early learning centers built. Child can learn from before they're born. Yeah, science over. that. Do we to them? Talk to them? That stuff works. So, at the college level, technical training level, we need to do something with that also. For moderate and low income people, there's no reason why their children shouldn't have access to college education, to technical education for a minimum of two years after they leave high school. It's going to be better for us to compete with the rest of the world. And I see you guys get a little restless even though you're so quiet. <laughs> I want to thank you again. There's a lot more for us to do to help build a better place in our community, in our state, and in our country for all of us. And as my wife told you, she would tell you how she fussed at me when I come home late. <laughs> But I'm grateful for your support. Thank you. <laughs> Certainly couldn't do what I do without your support. My son, Dalen, who I lost her mother just before we really got it right.
It's your care. You have helped me with Caleb tremendously, and I want to thank you for that. I know he doesn't understand the nuances of life sometimes, but I'm grateful. I'm grateful for my life, for being able to serve you, for being a servant leader that I'm taught to be, and for your support this evening. And for my team, would, would each person who is a volunteer on my team come forward, please? Go on up. Just give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. For all the guys in our office and the office for this campaign. I need more volunteers like them. So anybody else who want to volunteer, come, come on up. <laughs> I see nobody else. Come on. See them though. They'll, they'll connect you. All right, guys? Yeah. Thanks. See them. And, and, and of course, Anthea want to say something. Go ahead, Anthea. Good, e good evening, everyone. I, I, can you hear me okay? Yes. Because no, no, no. I'm not as skilled. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Anthea Pennant. Um, business development is my business. I'm the District Director of Supplier Relations and Diversity at Broward College, but I've been a friend of Dale Holness for almost 18 years. And when I tell you that he is a public servant, he truly is a public servant. He puts in so many hours doing the business for the people. Trust me when I tell you, Broward County cannot pay him enough, so he is definitely working at some serious minimum wage. But beyond that, you know, this is the first election that Dale is in that I'm actually going to be able to vote in. For all the years I've known him and I've worked on so many different campaigns. I've lived in, in uh, Pembroke Pines, in Weston, and I would drive to Lauder Hill to support this man and the work that he's doing. I believe that Dale is on a divine path. I truly believe that he's doing what God created him to do. And this is why I know this. Over the years working with Dale, I can remember from the very first campaign in his office, working tirelessly. But beyond that, when he won the election, he had another meeting with all of us who volunteered. And that can be all of you. And the thing that he said to me that resonates with me today is that he will be the tip of the spear and he needs the rest of us behind him to create that force and that drive to help him do the work that needed to be done. And I can tell you beyond any doubt that Dale is a courageous man. He's a courageous fighter for the people of Broward County. To be the tip of the spear requires courage. And when I tell you, he's had his fair share of people coming at him. And all of us need to be behind him, pushing that tip of the spear to break down the barriers that continue to keep prosperity from all of us. Prosperity for all is not simply a slogan. It is something that he believes and it's something that I believe. I serve on the Broward County Penny Tax Oversight because of Dale. And he did that to make sure that 30% that was sacred and secured for the businesses in Broward County. My daughter goes to Howard University, a letter of reference from Dale. Your support and your friendship, and it's not something that just is momentary. It doesn't happen just because he needs your help on his campaign. Support Dale through this entire period because I promise you it will be the best investment of time you can ever make. Not only make a donation to his fundraising uh, goals, but I need you to help us on the campaign. There are a group of us that meet every Thursday and we're working tirelessly to make sure, to ensure that Dale becomes the next congressman for District 20. Prosperity for all is a real thing. Prosperity for all 
is a real thing and all of us need to get on board with that. Dale, I am proud of you. I am proud of you, my friend. And Kim, thank you for being so patient with him. Because <laughs> I know he's putting in some long hours. We're all putting in long hours. So if you tonight decided you were going to write a check for X, add another zero to it. And if not, we have text messages that we can send to you. And you can send it out to your network of individuals and friends. And even if they start at $25, as long as it's recurring every month, do something. There are 12 candidates in the race. This is a serious election. And we cannot, we cannot take a chance. Dale must be the next congressman for District 20. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Anthea. You're welcome. Again, thanks to all of you. <laughs> so let, let me just tell you some things you can do. One, you can start by texting and calling all your friends and neighbor and tell them that you'd like for them to support their wholeness for Congress. And my website is simple, wholeness for Congress. Sometimes folks think, spell wholeness in different ways. But it's like holiness, you leave the eye out. Wholenessforcongress.com. They can donate there, they can volunteer there, on that side, wholenessforcongress.com. Remember, wholenessforcongress.com. You can also take some envelopes, and we should have extra envelopes. Do you have extra envelopes, folks? I see they're ready to, would you pass them around to everybody, see how many they want to take, and I have some in my pocket too, I always carry some. Give them to your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, wherever you go. And they kind of got stuck because I was out all day today at uh, different event, events for Juneteenth with Mario Van Peebles, who my wife told me this morning she had a crush on. And uh, she broke my heart. No, I said he was my boyfriend when I was young. Ah, uh, see, that's even worse. <laughs> so take some envelopes, pass them along to your friends and neighbors. Let me tell you a simple formula that if we're able to put in place could really work. If everyone here finds 25 pe people that commits to donating or raising a thousand dollars dollars. That give us 25,000. And if I get 100 people to do that, it's a million bucks. Right? That's what we need. We need at least a million dollars for this campaign. So I need your help. I need your support. I'm so humble that you took the evening out. You know it's a beautiful evening. Cool breeze blowing to be here with us this evening. Please also, if you believe in praying, pray. For God, guidance and protection. Because I tell you, they told me I'm at 10 points ahead of the polls. One person is at 17, one is at 25, I'm at 35 percent. Also told me that since you're the front runner, they're gonna send everything they can at you. They're gonna do everything to tear you down as much as possible. With what's real and with what's not real. The makeup. I don't really have to. But God is it. We've come this far, far in certain people. I believe that what Anthea says it's divine. Or it turns out. He told me that this morning again for I don't know how many times, the umpteen time. Others have told me the same. I got a lot of encouragement today from a full day of doing Juneteenth defense this morning with uh, Val Demins, Congressman that Val Demins uh, for our first event, uh, going to Aisha Jackson, uh, who is the star on Broadway Frozen, Mario Van Peebles and his daughter will be starring this movie about Harry and Harriet Moore, who died in the civil rights movement in Florida. 
On their 25th wedding, wedding anniversary in Melbourne, a bomb was placed under their house. And the house blew up right under their bed, the bomb was. Harry died instantly, his wife died. Nine days later, the clan decided they wanted to take them out. They had registered 120,000 black voters, fought for equal pay for teachers, because black teachers weren't paid the same as white teachers back then. Martin Luther King said he took inspiration from that. I, I believe that the mission I'm on is the right one. And I'm so grateful that my wife was standing with me, even though it gets really difficult some days. They pay a higher price to create a better place for all of us. Thank you again so much for being here.